So, Jonathan, you know, it's interesting. I mean, I, I definitely know when I was, you know, first, you know, personal training and working with individuals, I remember when I first started questioning, you know, the the calories in, calorie out model. I'd have individuals where that I'd be working with and I was all about, hey, just, you know, eat less, exercise more. You do that. You're going to get results. And when they weren't getting results, I mean, I literally and I'm embarrassed to say it now, but I literally was like, hey, you're, these people must be lying to me. You know, it's a funny thing <laughs> yeah. to think about now, but I was like, they're lying. They got to be cheating. So I'm, I'm interested. What was it for you? Like the first time you were just like, um, geez, man, something is wrong with this model. It was really exactly the same, Jade. Is one on a, on a micro perspective, when I was working with clients as a trainer, the same basic thing where people were not having the success I would expect. It was also... Uh, this may make people dislike me, but I am one of these fortunate individuals who has, I have a hard time gaining weight, not a hard time losing weight. Yeah, you're right. I hate I, you, man. <laughs> <laughs> but, but that's been actually very fascinating, Jade, because so at the same time, it's very difficult for me to build muscle. So I would be, like, when I track my calories, I would consume like 6,000 plus calories per day and still look like a bean pole rather than look like a man, which is what I wanted to look like. Right. And this actually made me – This, I mean, and this is really the profound, I think, insight that gets a lot of people excited about the Smarter Science of Slim and also about your work, and that is there are, there are people called naturally thin people, and they can eat whatever they want and not really exercise, and they stay slim. So we have millions of examples of individuals who their biology somehow – keeps them slim regardless of manual calorie monitoring. So the question is not, is that possible? Like it is. I experienced it firsthand. I was one of those people. And then I would also see people who were significantly overweight and I'd be like, oh my gosh, I'm eating so much more than them and they exercise more than I do. And I just started to say, this, this can't, this doesn't add up, right? I'm eating more and exercising less than these people and they weigh 150 more pounds than I do. So it made me question that core model and say, what is it about my biology and about other naturally thin people's biology that enables us to burn calories or, or stay thin the way we do? And how can other people do that as well? Yeah, you know, it's interesting hearing you talk about that because, I mean, um, my brother and I, my brother is a lot like you. He can't put on muscle, stays very lean. Me, I'm the exact opposite. I put on muscle very easily, but I also will put on fat um, very easily as well. And, you know, it's funny because in my clinic, you know, one of the things I still marvel at is I'll have individuals come in. I'll do, you know, a diet recall. And some of these people who are very obese are eating very, very small amounts of food and exercising mm -hmm. like crazy and cannot, uh, you know, burn fat. And, you know, so my whole thing is, is that I think um, you and I both sort of take, you know, sort of a, a different approach. We sort of look at the hormonal model versus the calorie model. And, you know, my thing is, and I'm interested in your thoughts on this, but my thing is, is that I think it's a mistake to, you know, really pit these two models against each other saying, hey, the calorie model is completely wrong and the hormonal model is completely right. I mean, I think there's some truth to both. But when I look at the calorie model, I sort of see the way it's prescribed, sort of the eat less, exercise more is it's. It's sort of, uh, you know, backwards, meaning that I think that ultimately, and I'm interested in your take on this, we may not agree here, but I, I still think ultimately that calorie deficits may matter, but that uh, ultimately hormones have to come first. So it's someone like yourself who is, uh, you know, very lean naturally, there's something going on in your metabolism that, you know, ultimately, if you want to lose weight, you know, you probably just eat. 3,000 calories versus the 6,000 calories you normally do, and that does it for you, and you're able to do it. Do that. But for me, if I even go from the 3,000 calories I eat to 800 calories a day, it doesn't work uh, for me that way. So I oftentimes sort of look at it like, do we need caloric deficits? And if so, what is driving those deficits? It can't just be math. It has to be something else. Hormones, I think, is where you and I focus. But I'm interested in your, your thoughts on that. I'm in exactly the same boat in the sense that it's a combination of the two. The nuance that I like to drive home, though, is that what, what I absolutely believe and have seen in my research is that we absolutely, like the idea of a caloric deficit is useful. However, 
the idea that we need to explicitly and manually force our body into a caloric deficit is where the problem arises. So there's a difference between saying a caloric deficit is, is irrelevant, which is not what I would say, and saying that thinking that we need to consciously force our body into a state of caloric deficit is what I would say is foolish. So let me give some examples. For example, eating you know, a bunch, eating 2,000 calories, you should never actually do this, eating 2,000 calories of simple refined carbohydrate versus eating 2,000 calories of protein. You will be in a state of caloric deficit if you ate 2,000 calories of protein simply because of the different way your body will metabolize those calories, the amount of calories you will burn during digestion, yada, yada, yada. I mean, you're eating the same number of calories in both cases, but because the quality of calories is different, you very well may achieve a caloric deficit in one of those worlds, whereas you wouldn't in the other world. So the point that I'm trying to make here is that a caloric deficit absolutely matters. However, pursuing it directly by like just eating less food, I think is a terrible approach. Pursuing it indirectly by increasing the quality of your exercise, just like you guys say, and increasing the quality of the food you eat, you will accidentally experience a caloric deficit because your body will automatically create that state and the whole body automatically doing it is so critical because that's how it becomes sustainable is when your body can maintain that state, you will maintain your health. Whereas if you try to manually balance calories in, calories out, it will work as long as you can do it. But 95% plus of people can do it for maybe a few weeks and then they fall off and then they gain more weight. So it's about that metabolic effect you talk about, training your body to metabolize things differently so that it can achieve a caloric deficit rather than you consciously achieving a caloric deficit. Does that make sense? Yeah, it makes a whole lot of sense to me. And the way I would say it is, you know, that a hormonally balanced, you know, body or, you know, a metabolism that is working efficiently really results in a caloric deficit. A caloric deficit, it doesn't work in the reverse, though. A caloric deficit does not re result in a balanced metabolism. So, you know, I agree 100%. I think that people don't understand when I think of the metabolism, I really think of it sort of like, you know, a seesaw. You eat less, the body compensates. You know, you get hungry. You exercise more, the body compensates. You get hungry. You know, it's basically you push a lever and you change hormones that make it almost impossible for you to stay on um, the program that you're trying to do. So like you say, you cannot force your body into this caloric de deficit. As soon as you do, your body actually pushes on you in the other direction. And so part of, you know, what I, um, one of my big pet peeves in this industry is, is that I think 20 something year old men, you know, <laughs> when they're, when they're young and they're able to, you know, pretty much eat what they want and train how they want. A lot of what we are teaching is based on that. You know what I mean? And mm -hmm. ultimately mm -hmm. uh, the metabolism does not work like that, except for a very, small minority of individuals. Now, they'll say to people like you and I, they'll say, well, how do you explain, you know, people in concentration camps, you know, and things like that? They certainly get thin. Well, that's because it was forced on them. How do you explain our hunter-gatherer ancestors? They ate less and exercised more. And that's because it was sort of forced on them. They had no choice but to do it. But in a world where there's lattes on every corner, um, we can give into our hunger and cravings in, you know, it, in a split second, it simply does not work in my mind. And I see that clinically all the time. And, it, you know, my thing is, is that from, uh, you know, looking at your work, the work that I do and the work that many others are doing, I mean, I think finally people are starting um, to get that. Yes, a caloric deficit may be necessary to lose weight, but you certainly cannot do it coming at it strictly from counting, counting mathematics. That's exactly right. And it's actually just two quick points. It's funny that you mentioned the point of our ancestors may have uh, eaten less and exercised more. And I, actually, it was fascinating because just recently, this uh, I think this week, a new study was published where yeah, I saw this. Actually, I saw this. Do you see this where they actually yep. have now proven essentially that modern hunter gatherers are not burning more calories than the normal everyday sort of European or, or Western sort of American lifestyle, which is interesting, fascinating nonetheless. But the other thing that's important to note is 
again, this whole concept of eating less and exercising more. So we need to step back and Jade, you did an excellent job on your recent Huffington Post article and talking about this. If the goal is weight loss, like that's what happens in concentration camps. People lose weight. They lose weight. And if you see pictures of people who leave concentration camps, most people do not want to look that way. Like I don't think anyone's goal when they embark on anything health and fitness related is to look like someone who emerged from a concentration camp. <laughs> I think their goal is to look and feel healthy and fit and feel that way for the rest of their life. And if you want to look like someone who left a concentration camp, eat less and exercise more because it'll burn everything. It's like pouring gas on your garden to kill the weeds. Like, yeah, it'll kill the weeds, but it's going to kill everything. And it will. It will. It absolutely will. But I don't think that's our goal. Our goal is to be healthy and fit and look vibrant. And the way we do that is actually by eating more higher quality food, which actually doesn't mean eat more calories because these are nutrient dense foods, which are actually going to enable us to accidentally eat fewer calories, but way more nutrition which is certainly different than eating less calories and less nutrition. One triggers a starvation response, the other one doesn't. And if we exercise more, Jade, as you talk about so well in your research, you cause a hormonal change that no amount, none, no amount of traditional like jogging will ever cause that change. It just won't. So it's totally, I mean, it really is a apples to oranges comparison. They're two completely different approach and they yield different results. We can argue like which is better. I don't even like having that argument. Like if you want to look like a bag of bones, if you want to look like you left the concentration camp, eat less and exercise more. If you want to look like what I actually think you want to look like, and if you actually want to feel the way I think you want to feel, then eat higher quality food and a lot of it and do less but higher quality exercise. Yeah, I love the way you put that. And one of the things that I always like to, you know, kind of uh, to do, and I think that ultimately someone should put together a book like this, a picture book that basically shows the volume of food, the amount of food and the calories of food. You know, like if you take uh, 10 chicken breasts and 10 donuts and basically put those two things side by side, they have the same amount of calories. There is no way uh, you're going to eat those 10 chicken breasts. But I know you might not be able to, Jonathan, but I know I can eat 10 donuts. <laughs> and I know a lot of some of my clients can as well. So it, it goes into this thing, the quality of food you're eating also determines the quantity of food you're eating. My, my whole thing is that even if we get into this calorie argument, having a low calorie, you know, so-called healthy breakfast is neither low calorie or healthy if it leads you to eat a very high calorie, unhealthy meal later in the evening. And that's exactly what is happening to most people who are using the traditional approach. That's exactly right. And, and the traditional approach, I think, is very short term focused. You know, we can do anything, quote unquote, for 30 days. And if your goal is to make the scale move as much as it can in 30 days, I mean, ask a boxer how to do that. Ask a wrestler how to do that. Ask anyone who has to make weight. There's very specific things. You dehydrate yourself. You just put as little into your body as you can and you make as much come out of your body as you can. And you can do all kinds of things to make things come out of your body that are not healthy. <laughs> but that's, that's what you do to make weight for your wrestling match next week. Or that's what you do for you know, your, your runway show in two weeks. If our goal, and I think it is, is to think about the next 30 years, the next 60 years, that requires a much different approach. And that, that's kind of a really simple point, which we, we, we've lost sight of because of all this media garbage, right? I mean, if you do something to achieve a result, and you stop, like the result goes away. So anytime we want to try like a 17 day diet or a three day this or a two day that, like what happens on day three? What happens on day four? What happens on day 18? You, it's got to be something you can keep up or any result that you get, you're going to lose. And you may even regress because like if you burn off all your muscle tissue and then you go back to eating the way you're eating before, well, now you're running slower, so you're going to gain back even more fat. So that long-term approach, I think, is also really, really critical to keep in mind. Yeah, you know, it's it's funny. I think the people who, um, and I know you have these conversations all the time, and I enjoy having these conversations with people who sort of uh, challenge the approach that you and I sort of uh, put out there, this sort of different approach. But, uh, you know, one of the things that I think they miss or they're not thinking about is just what you're saying is that anything that you do, that is going to deliver results has to be something you can do forever. And, you know, I know you probably know the numbers on this better than I do, but what are the long-term 
um, you know, uh, statistics with this. My understanding is, and I know you've looked at the research more in depth than, than I have, but my understanding is if you look two years out, um, you know, for people who go on traditional weight loss diets, it's something like less than 5% actually, uh, you know, end up being able to keep that weight off. And I don't know if those numbers are, are accurate. You probably have the more accurate number, but do, or do you know what that number is? Yeah, it's, you're very, very close. It's 4.6%. And just to put that in perspective of how low that is, the long-term success rate for quitting smoking, <clears throat> cold turkey, so no help. And remember, nicotine is the third most addictive substance in the world, second only to heroin and cocaine, is 5.5%. So that means we're about a percent more likely to give up the most addictive substance in the world with no assistance than we are to be able to continue to force ourselves to eat less and exercise more. And, but there's a key point there, right? Quote, unquote, eating less and exercising more works. But like you said, Jade, that, I put the quotes around it because I define works as for the rest of your life, you will have the physique and the health that you want, not for as long as you can keep up this ridiculous routine. Yeah, that's that's really a, a great way to, to sort of say it. And and my one of the things that I say that I get a lot of heat for, and in that Huffington Post article, I got a lot of comments that people didn't like this. But the the way I like to say this is that any other model in any other discipline with a track record as poor as the calories in, calories out model would have really been sort of labeled useless and discarded long ago in any other model that you look at. So it's really interesting to me that, you know, we really just keep practicing something that, that you say may work in the short term, but has an abysmal statistical you know, a success rate in the long run. I mean, it just it really is a shame that people still uh, will defend a model that really does not uh, you know, give any kind of results. You know, the, the, one of the things I want to do, though, is because I know you and I, uh, we love this kind of stuff. You and I could probably sit here and talk all day and I'm actually really enjoying this conversation. But, you know, one of the things that I don't know uh, if you saw this, thanks for mentioning that Huffington Post article is pretty interesting, though, because I got an awful lot of negative comments on that. And I think those comments were justified because you, as you and I talked about the calorie model, one of the things that I think makes it so appealing is that it's simple. And so when you and I start talking about hormones and uh, quality of food and quality of exercise, that begins a whole other discussion about what is that? And I know I really like your model of the sane foods. And uh, I have my model of sort of fat loss foods. But, you know, just in the interest, of, I'm actually recording this conversation as well. And just in the interest of covering that for people, because I want to share this conversation with people, what would you say, like, you know, for these people who you know, have this issue of what do I do, Jonathan? What do I do, Jade? You know, with these sane foods, what, what do you tell them to make it simple for them? Well, I, <clears throat> let me answer that in two ways. I will definitely define sane. But one thing that I think is very helpful is uh, I read your article. I actually read all the comments, and you're an amazing trooper for putting up with some of the crap that people threw at you. So I give you props <laughs> for that, first of all. <laughs> it's like a religious issue for some people, which always kind of bothers me. I'm like, come on, guys. We're all just like trying to pursue science here. So right. Get, like negative and pissy. But so props to you. Um, what I will say is that, it's, again, it's not that, and we talked about this before, it's not that calories in, calories out doesn't matter. But think about the way any other system in our body works, like our respiratory system, right? Like breaths in and breaths out matters, but the thought that you need to consciously think about how many breaths you're taking in and how many breaths you're letting out is ridiculous. Think about how your heart works. Like it pumps blood in and pumps blood out, but it does that on its own. And those things can break down, right? Like you can, you might need a pacemaker. And if you, if you smoke and you take in the wrong quality of air, you might need a respirator. Like there are, when bodily systems are given the wrong inputs, and I say wrong quality of inputs, their natural ability to keep us healthy breaks down. The same happens with your metabolic system. When it's given the wrong quality of inputs, its ability to keep us healthy and fit naturally, because that's our natural state. We didn't evolve to be sick and heavy all the time. We would have died off as a species a long time ago. So calories in, calories out absolutely matters, just like breaths in and breaths out matters. The nuance is, do we need to manually regulate that or not? My research shows the answer is no. 
that if we can give our body what it is designed and adapt it to consume, it takes care of that for us. So calories in, calories out absolutely matters. What doesn't, what isn't required is conscious regulation of it when we uh, provide our body with the right quality of stuff and segueing into sane. Well, my research showed to be the right quality of stuff are what I call sane foods or foods that are satisfying, unaggressive, nutritious, and inefficient. Quickly defining each one of those, uh, um, sane or, uh, excuse me, piety, the first one, uh, it just means how, how many of these calories do we need to fill us up and keep us full. So there's satisfying foods like non-starch vegetables, high quality proteins, things like that. They fill us up in relatively few calories, whereas like processed starches and sweets are not satisfying. They take a lot of calories to fill us up. The uh, A stands for aggression. This is very similar to glycemic load, glycemic index. It's just how quickly food is converted into sugar. It spikes our insulin levels. We want to eat unaggressive foods. N stands for nutrition. We're all familiar with that, but the key thing is to think about nutrition per calorie. Like, are whole grains a good source of fiber? Well, if if you look at it per calorie, they're not at all. Like compare whole grain flour or, or whole wheat flour to spinach, and it, it's anemic. Yeah, compare no comparison. To, you know, there, there's no comparison at all. you got to look at it per calorie. And then finally, efficiency, which is the least well-known, has to do with how, how uh, easily our body can convert this substance into triglyceride or body fat. And, for example, protein takes twice as many calories to go through all of the chemical processes that need to take place to turn it into triglyceride than, for example, carbohydrate. It doesn't mean carbohydrate is bad for you. It just means our body stores carbohydrate as fat more efficiently than it does protein. So if you add this stuff all up, there's three things in common. Foods that are high in water, fiber, and protein. Those are the cornerstone of, of eating sane foods. They're, they're rich in water. They're rich in fiber. They're rich in protein. They're non-starchy vegetables, high-quality proteins, and natural whole food fats. And making it all make a lot of sense those are the only foods that were available to us for up until about 100 years ago. So it probably makes sense that our bodies run best on them, considering that there were no other options available while our bodies were evolving. Yeah, you know, that's fantastic the way you put that. And, and I would say the same thing to these people to say, OK, Jade, Jonathan, tell us what to do. It's exactly the same. Jonathan's sane foods are, you know, sort of my what I call fat loss foods, and they're foods that really balance hunger, keep you satisfied for longer, decrease cravings, and sort of uh, balance energy. And they're the exact same foods, foods high in lean protein, you know, good fats, water, and fiber, and really protein, water, fiber, protein, water, fiber, protein, water, fiber. And it's really interesting because you can say that till you're blue in the face and people still will ask you, well, Jonathan, Jade, and I don't know if you get this question, but I assume you do. What about whole grains? What about this and that? I mean, really, it's protein, water, you know, and fiber. And when you look at it from that point of view, really, that to me means all non-starchy vegetables, you know, pretty much all fruits, but especially the low sugar fruits. And the other thing that fruits and vegetables have is a ton of water and then good quality protein sources. Now, like you said, it's not about, you know, the fact that carbohydrates are, you know, necessarily these evil foods or that, you know, um, some of these foods that people label, those are all evil and you should never eat them. It's just about what you said, that our bodies are built for that. And if you fill up on those foods, you are going to have a hormonally balanced metabolism and you're automatically going to eat less. If you sit down and eat four cups of broccoli, and two chicken breasts, you are not going to have room or the desire to sit down and have try to have a cheesecake after that. You know, for most people, that's just not going to happen. One of the things I like to make the comparison between, uh, you probably heard this, I don't know if you have, uh, Jonathan, but I like to make this comparison between, you know, the world famous Kashi Golin cereal, which everyone sees as sort of the, the epitome of the dieting health and fitness world. Two cups of Kashi Golin and a glass of orange juice has more calories and is less food than an eight egg white omelet with three cups of vegetables and a side of blueberries. I don't even know. I, you know, I'm a big eater. I couldn't even eat that eight egg white omelet. So when people ask what to do, I think it's pretty simple. We just want to make it more complicated. 
I would agree with you. It is it is very simple. And we another a way I like to say it too is like just always be too full for dessert, because in many ways what you're eating for your meal can't possibly be as bad for you as dessert will be. So like if all you literally do is just like double up on your main dish, assuming your main dish isn't fettuccine Alfredo, you know, and just <laughs> have an extra serving of vegetables on the side, just like eat so much dinner that you're too full for dessert ironically you will feel better i mean and you'll and 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 psychologically you'll feel better because it's a psychological fact that if you tell a person don't do this or you can't have this and and you tell them negative things that is treated much differently than if you say i want you tomorrow to eat as much egg whites non-starchy vegetables and blueberries for breakfast and they're vibrant in color and they're fresh. I want you to just try to eat as much of that as you possibly can. That is a completely different mindset than, all right, you've got X points. Don't spend them too inappropriately or you're going to be hungry. You know, I mean, it's a yeah. totally, it's empower. It's pers uh, Mother Teresa once said something that I love and she was said, Mother Teresa, uh, will you come march with us against the war in Vietnam? This was back when the Vietnam War was taking place. And she said, I will never march against the war in Vietnam. But if you have a march for peace, I'll lead the way. And I think that's what we're saying, Jade, is we're saying pursue the positive. Just eat more nutritious foods and do uh, more higher quality exercise. In doing that, you will actually have to exercise less because you'll be too sore to exercise more. But it's like pursue the positive rather than this idea of dieting and deprivation and starving yourself because that doesn't work psychologically and that's why it doesn't work long term. Yeah, I think uh, I think that's great. I mean, I basically talk about this whole idea of eat, you know, more of the right foods more often. And I know people get confused on those right foods. One one other thing I just want I just want to get your sense of this cuz I know people will sort of ask about this. One of the things, so they hear us make examples about like this eight egg white omelet. And of course, then, you know, people will jump on and say, wait a second, what's wrong with the yolks and things like that? And I, I guess I, I want to hear your your answer to this too. But my answer would be there's absolutely nothing wrong with the yolks at all. The point that we're just trying to make is that if you load up on protein, fiber, and water-based foods, you are not going to necessarily be hungry. But adding the yolks in there is absolutely fine. They're healthy. Um, they're good fats. It's not going to be a huge issue. But I guess one of the things that I would say is that if you have a very obese individual who already has you know, insulin resistance and all these blood fats floating around in their body, um, even healthy fats, you don't necessarily want to overdo those. But I don't think there's anything wrong with the yolks. And I just wanted to see you know, your thoughts on that, you know, in terms of when we talk about, you know, sort of this idea of lean proteins, oftentimes the people in the world of the primal nutrition and things like that get in an uproar. Yeah, I, I'm so happy you brought this up because this is definitely where I get the most flack because there's, I think, at least three chapters in the Smarter Science of Slim just extolling the virtues of fat and completely debunking the whole like low fat message. Uh, where I, where I, my key thing is that there are fats that are incredibly healthy, like just phenomenally healthy. Seafood, uh, for example, plant fats, chia seeds, flax seeds, avocados, things like that. And then there are fats which are neutral or, or pretty good, such as um, like natural saturated fats, like from coconuts, from nuts, from, from uh, high-quality grass-fed meats. And then there are fats which are terrible. Those are artificial fats, things like trans fats. I, my research suggests, that those high quality fats, seafood, uh, plant fats, such as the chia seeds, the omega-3 fats, they are so important for your health that I actually want people to go out of their way to consume those foods. I want you to eat fatty fish. I want you to eat chia seeds and flax seeds, and I want you to eat coconut, and I want you to eat avocado. Okay, if you do that and you eat bacon and you eat a bunch of egg yolks, and well, now you're going to be getting 50 to 60 percent of your calories from fat, which is not necessarily bad. But if you want to load up also on vegetables and lean protein, what you'll find is that if you're eating those super high quality fats and you're eating the water, fiber, and protein heavy foods, 
you won't have enough room for the other kinds of fats. So what I say is I'm just being intentional about the fats you're eating. I often eat egg yolks, but I often don't simply because I'm too full from all of the seafood and all of the plant fat fats I ate earlier in the day. So it's not about avoiding them. It's about just like there's some vegetables that are healthier than other vegetables, and there's some fruits that are healthier than other fruits, and there's some fats, and there's some meat. I mean, certainly, I think organic grass-fed uh, beef is better for us than pink slime. They're both meat, <laughs> but I don't think anyone's going to say, eat some more pink slime. So I'm saying, I want you to stuff yourself with these optimal fats. And when yeah. you do that, you aren't going to have room for the other fats. Yeah, I would, I would agree with that 100%. I mean, for me, it's the same thing. I mean, you know, fat... You know, I don't label fat as evil. And, you know, just like you said, I really don't label starch as evil either. I just think that given for most people where they want to get to, um, they given the the uh, natural lifestyle we all live as Americans and most of the people you and I are talking to are individuals who want to lose fat and who have metabolisms that already have high, you know, high amounts of fat on the body and high resting blood sugars and things like that, that, you know, essentially what we want to do, I think all we're both saying is that if you eat higher protein, higher water foods, higher fiber foods, supplement in the very healthy fats and minimize sort of your starch intake, uh, fat loss is going to happen really, really easily. And yes, there are certainly those uh, in my clinical experience, you know, those in their 20s and 30s with healthy metabolisms who can gorge themselves on fat and lose a ton of fat in the process. I mean, I see way more of those people than I do people gorging on carbohydrates. I would just say for the very obese and, you know, uh, those who are diabetic and things like that, they really do want to stick to, you know, um, water, fiber, protein, and the good fat. So, uh, you know, I'm, I'm glad to sort of have that discussion because I think um, I oftentimes you know, get blowback from people on the whole fat issue. And I just want to hear your take on that. But, you know, well, I'm not, if, go ahead. Jay, do you mind if I add one more thing just because sure. I am going to get blowback if I don't say this? So <laughs> this is people go crazy about this kind of stuff. Um, uh, the other way I like to phrase what I just said, which is echoing what you said, is I say be intentional about the fat you're eating. Yeah. Just like I would say be intentional of the carbohydrates you're eating and be intentional of the protein you're eating, which I think some people have lost sight of. It becomes a religious issue, right? So, there was like this anti-fat movement. So now people are like pro-fat. So there's like, if you're going to eat eggs, eat the whole egg. If you're going to eat steak, eat a fatty steak. And it, whoa, 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 that's not being intentional. Right. Being intentional is saying, I'm going to choose where I get my fats. I personally love egg white omelets. Like I actually like them better than whole egg omelets. So I'm just choosing, not because I'm anti-egg yolks. It's because I would much rather have, you know, a tablespoon of peanut butter or like, a cup of, not a cup of almonds, but you know, some almonds after I eat, because I would much rather get my fat from those sources than getting my fat from eggs. Just like we choose, the, the paleo community chooses organic grass-fed beef versus pink slime. It's not because they're anti-protein, it's because they want the highest quality protein. They're intentional about the protein they're eating. So for people just to say, Jonathan, you go anti-fat, and then in your book you say, low-fat Greek yogurt or non-fat Greek yogurt or low-fat cottage cheese, non-fat cottage cheese. That's because in my experience, there's very little taste difference. So I would much rather be able to add a bunch of peanut butter to my Greek yogurt and have, you know, and enjoy that rather than not be able to add anything to it because it's already got a bunch of fat in it. So I'm yeah. just being as intentional as everyone thinks we should be with carbohydrate and as we should be with protein. Let's also be that intentional with fat. Yeah, for some reason, I mean, and I, I, I did a blog on this on the Metabolic Effect blog. For some reason, people, when, when I look at this, I look at, you know, obviously, I'm, I'm definitely in the camp of, you know, like you say, you know, uh, you know the, the sort of sane foods and the fat loss foods. Starch is probably the most uh, troubling, but there's certainly people, you know, probably more like yourself, you know, compared to me who can eat a ton of starch and still remain lean. There are those people out there. There are certainly those people who need a ton of fat and still remain lean. I think what, you know, ultimately what we're looking at is we're looking at an obesity epidemic. And in my clinic, you know, ultimately fat can still, you know, make you make some people fat, you know, uh, starch can still make some people fat. And I guess technically if you could eat enough, you know, broccoli and chicken breast, perhaps <laughs> that would get you fat. The problem is it just, you just simply cannot you know, for, uh, you know, 
99.99% of the population. You know, so it, you know, I agree with you. Fat and starch, I look at it as, you know, metabolic effect. You know, the acronym for that is me, meaning, you know, you as an individual have to sort of be intentional and pay attention to your metabolic expression, your sort of personal preferences. Like, you know, for instance, if you have a moral, you know, thing against meat, then obviously. Um, your personal preference is going to be to go to the vegetarian, vegan side of the equation. I think that stuff's important. Your psychological sensitivities as well. All this sort of goes into this. So certainly those people who gravitate more towards a high fat diet, you know, ultimately it's about, and I, I'm, I'm sure you would say the same thing. If your hunger is balanced, your cravings are balanced, your energy is balanced, and you are losing fat and getting the results you want, then you're obviously doing whatever you're doing, you're doing correctly. I would agree with that wholeheartedly, and that's the what what I'm trying to do, and I think what you are trying to do is simply try. Let's try to lay down some science, so we have a common vocabulary, so that like we can all agree. You know, it is better to get your fat from some salmon than it is from some French fries. <laughs> yeah. You know, and and we can agree on that, and we can just be intentional, and we can say, and you know what? Basically, also, if what you're doing is working, that's all. Keep it up. Awesome. Yeah, I mean, yeah. if you're eating less and you're exercising more and you're having success, good for you. That's awesome, you know? Yeah, yeah. I love the way you say that. And I would even say that, you know, obviously, I'm, I'm sure you're, you know, me being a natural health care provider too, but I would even say that I would prefer you get your fat from salmon versus, you know, a fish oil supplement, you know? And it, it's, mm -hmm. you know, we really do want to get people focusing on food. Well, you know, it's, it's interesting, man. We have to do this again because I'm sure – uh you know, uh, I, I want to pass this this uh, this conversation out to our listeners if you're cool with that. And you know, the other thing is, I'm sure they're going to want to um, you know hear our take on uh, on exercise as well. But um, I'm basically out of time, and I, and I don't want to keep you any longer. But let's let's do this again, man. It's, it, this is a whole lot of fun and uh, just a ton of great information. I uh, appreciate it, Jade. Well, if you don't mind, can I leave you and your listeners with one tidbit of information I discovered recently, which I think you'll love, that has to do with calories in, calories out? Absolutely, man. Please. All right. So I recently uh, was doing some additional research, and I did discover that according to some data, we are, on average, eating more than we were in the 1970s. Okay, so we are. It's on average, we're consuming 425 more calories per person per day than we are in the 1970s. But here's what's interesting, Jade. Let's do some math real quick here. Okay, 425 more calories per person per day. Per day for 10 years, if it's just calorie math, equals 440 pounds of fat. Okay, we're certainly heavier today than we were in the 1970s. But we're not 440, is 440 pounds in 10 years. It's been about 40 years. We're not. 1600 pounds heavier per person <laughs> so there has to be something else metabolically going on yes we are eating more why are we eating more and why aren't we gaining 2000 pounds from eating all of that food and that's why i think your work is so interesting and hopefully why folks think my work is interesting as well yeah it it really is amazing when you put it in in those terms isn't it it's just it there is absolutely something uh, else going on so uh you know uh definitely i'm going to tell all my people go out and get the smarter science of slim um check out jonathan's work uh jonathan you're the man let's do this again soon my, my man sounds wonderful jade i look forward to it all right take good care bro all right bye-bye